Hi, I'm Jerry Lipkin at Valley National Bank. We believe consumers need help understanding the complex banking and financial issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Valley National Bank, NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, the Russell Berry Foundation, ShopRite Supermarkets, ADP, a comprehensive provider of human resources technology and services, and by Suez, ready for the resource revolution. Promotional support provided by Commerce Magazine and by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got this? Man. Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, Steve Arbaro here. It is my honor and my pleasure to welcome uh, Tavis Smiley, the host of uh, the Tavis Smiley Show on PBS and the author of the book, Before You Judge Me, The Triumph and Tragedy of Michael Jackson's Last Days. Tavis, thank you so much for joining us. An honor to be on your program, sir. Thank you, Steve. Let me ask you, uh, you and I were just talking before we uh, started this conversation. Never met Michael Jackson? Met him once or twice. Yeah. Never spent any time with him. But Real time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you knew his mom? Yeah, sure. Connection? Mm -hmm. Indiana, is it the Indiana, Indiana Connection? Indiana. Talk yeah. about the Indiana, Indiana Connection. Michael grew up in Gary, Indiana, as you know, steel town outside of Chicago. Um, I grew up uh, a couple hours down the road in north central Indiana, cornfield. Uh, my dad's in the Air Force, so um, we're the only black family in the trailer park that we lived in, one of a few black families in my school. So Michael's environment is very uh, chocolate, yeah. and I'm growing up in a vanilla slice. But we're both in the state of Indiana, a couple hours apart. So as, as we talk about this, one of the things that struck me about the book is the personal connection. Mm -hmm. You felt the real personal connection yeah. to him. When I was a kid, um, first of all, as I said in the epilogue, I think, I hated the name Tavis. I would get teased all the time with a name like Tavis Smiley. And kids can be cruel. They'd call me Travis Smelly. Not Smiley, Smelly. Did you have another name? I basically, in my head, fell in love with the idea of being named Mike, because I'm watching the Saturday morning cartoon. I yeah. love Michael, and I love the Jacksons. And so, yeah, I love the Jacksons, but to your point, I love Michael. And I, I sort of renamed myself Michael. So I connected to Michael, not just artistically, but I connected to him uh, in, his, in the energy of his persona. Again, I love that cartoon. And, you know, as it turns out, I grew up in a Pentecostal church, a very strict, um, charismatic, mm. religious environment. And there are so many things we couldn't do. It was wrong for me. It was a sin, literally, in the church I grew up, Steve, it was a sin to listen to secular music. You were going to hell mm. if you listened to secular music. So I had to sneak to watch that cartoon. I had to sneak to watch him on Soul Train. I had to sneak to listen to him on the radio. But I made a connection with him nonetheless, even though I was going to hell mm. for listening to him as a child in the, uh, the tradition of my, of my faith upbringing. Now, you're an author of 18 books. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the most powerful that I love was the book on Dr. King. Yeah, thank you. Right? Thank you, yeah. The, the link between uh, Martin and, and Michael is really a last days sort of connection. The King book, as you know, is about the last year of Dr. King's life. So the entry point is his Beyond Vietnam speech here in New York City at Riverside Church. Mm. He gives that speech uh, coming out against the war in Vietnam, calls America the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, and everybody turns on Martin. And, um, he dies broke, and Harry Belafonte has to pay for his funeral because nobody wanted to be around Dr. King. He was toxic in the last year of his life, last days. Michael, same thing, except it's not the last year, it's the last 16 weeks. The entry point is his going to London to say, this is it, Steve, this is it. I'm coming back one more time. 16 weeks later, he's dead. Mm. When he makes the announcement to your point earlier about my connection to his mother, I make a phone call to his mom, say, you know what? Can you, can you hook a brother up with some tickets? Yeah, I want to call that. Michael, everybody's calling Michael. So, <laughs> can, you hook, can you hook a brother up? So I got... And by the way, she said she would get you she, good tickets. She hooked me up. So I have, my, I have my concert ticket, Steve. I bought my plane ticket. I have my hotel reservations. I'm on my way to London 
to see this last performance of Michael Jackson. He dies on me. So I want to know as a fan and back to my Indiana roots, what happened between the time you said you were going to come back one more time and 16 weeks later? What, what, happened, what happens in our lives when we're fighting to get back to center, when we're trying to find that, that, that moral compass, if you will, that thing that drives us, that makes us who we are? We've gotten off center and we're trying to get back to who we really are. And we don't make it. Tavis, let's pick it up with the doctors. Yeah. Comrade Murray. Mm -hmm. He was the one who was administering the propofol. Mm -hmm. There was another doctor, Dr. Klein, administering the... Demerol. Explain what one was for the propofol. Yeah. Was that to fall for, asleep? Fall asleep. Because Michael Jackson was having a hard time. Yep, couldn't shut it down. Insomniac to the 10th power. With anxiety. Yes. And the, is a part in the book, uh, as you know, where I quote Michael talking to someone where he says he didn't want to sleep too long. He wanted to sleep, but not too long. He was afraid that if he slept too long, God would give all the good ideas to Prince. <laughs> True story, Michael said that. Um, but Demerol is what's been given him by Dr. Arnie Klein for the other issues that he's had, the plastic surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So he's taking Demerol from one doctor, Propofol from another doctor. It's a, it turns out to be a, 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 a damning cocktail, um, as we found out you know, after his death. Yeah. Go back to the, um, the concerts. He signs to do 10, mm -hmm. all of a sudden it becomes 50. Michael couldn't have done 10 shows, in my judgment, in the condition he was in. But 50? Who does 50 shows? So the concert promoters are greedy. All the creditors got their hooks into him. Um, there are other... Family. Sorry for interrupting. No, please. Family. His father wants Michael to... Joseph. Joseph wants Michael to, to scrub the concerts in London and do a reunion tour with his brother. But everybody's just on him. And so it's, it's one of those things where, you, on the one hand, you have to be careful what you ask for when you, want, when you get that kind of fame. Michael wanted that. Let's be clear about it. Mm. He wanted to be the biggest and the baddest and the boldest in the world. So you got to be careful what you ask for. That's the lesson, I think, for Michael and other artists who were, you know, put fortune and fame above everything else. What did we misunderstand about him? In no particular order, number one, something happens not just to stars, but to everyday people, everyday fellow citizens. When we live lives where we become rudderless, you got to be anchored to something. Mm. And when our lives become rudderless, we drift away. And so I think some of us um, didn't see Michael becoming as rudderless as he was. That's the, I think we missed that story of how he drifted away. He drifted like right in front of our very eyes. Second thing is that, is that and we know about the, about the self-medication, um, but when people try to paint Michael as a drug user, a drug abuser, like Prince, I think we missed the story that they're not recreational users. Michael was using it because he couldn't sleep. He was using it because of the pain that he was in. Prince was using it because of his hip. And that's not, I mean, I, I regret, I'm sad, not just regret, I hate sad that both of them are gone. But you got to put that in context. And finally, it's what I said a moment ago, that we get so caught up in their iconography, we, we lose sight of their humanity. Can you imagine what it would be like to not have had a childhood? I loved and relished my childhood. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine not having had a childhood. Which, I mean, which you say he did not. He did not have. He never had a childhood. And so when that's taken from you and you got people who are pushing you and, and pressuring you and beating you and they want more hits out of you and everybody's into you for something and you're a child and you don't have a childhood, that has huge implications later on. Some people say, wow, Michael Jackson died at 50. He died so young. Yeah. You say, wow, he died at 50. He lived that long. Yeah. That's when you get into this text and you see that last 16 weeks, and all the hell that he's under, all the pressure that he's under, the expectation that he's under, um, it's just hard to imagine. And so again, I don't make excuses for Michael Jackson. He had many wounds that were self-inflicted. Mm -hmm. He was human, not human and divine, but I am more brought low by the pain of how he had to navigate all that he was under for that period of time and how he made it I quite frankly don't know. On behalf of everyone, uh, public television family, thank you. You are a good man. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate you, man. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Steve Adubato, uh, welcome to uh, the Cone Resnick Foundation 25th Annual Golf um, Invitational uh, event. This is a charity outing and it's our honor to interview uh, for the second year in a row. Um, Joe Torrey, who is no stranger to everyone watching right now, Joe Torrey is not only a Hall of Famer, not only the former 
uh, manager of the Yankees, uh, just a few uh, World Series, and also the co-founder of the Joe Torre Safe at Home Foundation, and one of the recipients of the two uh, charities that this great golf event uh, is a part of, right? Uh, yes, uh, Steve, and, and I, I just feel so blessed to you know, not only be recognized as far as our charity Safe at Home uh, is concerned, but to be uh, connected with, with Colin Resnick for a number of years, uh, you know, it's a class outfit, I guess the way we'd say it in the clubhouse. Uh, you, you do it the right way and uh, people trust you and, and trust is something you have to earn. And, and that's, uh, that's why I'm here and that's why I enjoyed our relationship. Yeah, you've represented the firm, you've been a spokesperson for, spokesperson for the firm and you pick uh, those who you represent uh, very carefully. Um, so let me ask you, the Safe at Home Foundation started what year? Uh, it started in 2002, uh, 2002. Uh, and when my wife and I came to New York uh, in 96, uh, Allie asked me what charity you want to get involved in. And I, you know, I said, uh, how about domestic violence? Because I had just gone through uh, a seminar with Allie right before our daughter was born in, in uh, December of 95 and discovered a lot of my feelings that I never talked about, uh, insecurity, nervousness, a lot of stuff I went through school with. Uh, I realized I wasn't born with, with those traits that I was sort of creative with what was going on in my home. And I knew my dad was abusive to my mom. I mean, you know? I, I knew that. I mean, I was, he was, a, he was a New York City policeman and I, uh, I was eight or nine years old when I uh, was in the dining room and my sister who was protecting my mom because a, a, a battle started in the kitchen and uh, poured out into the dining room and my dad went for his revolver in the drawer because my sister sort of had, she didn't sort of had, she had a knife in her hand to protect my mom. And I'm a sorter on the, I was on the corner of, of the uh, table and he said, put the knife down, put the knife down, put the knife down. And I went over and took it out of my sister's hand and put it on the table. And then he closed the drawer where the revolver was. So uh, I witnessed all that. Uh, I never actually saw him hit my mom, but I saw the results of, of his doing that. So, uh, you know, I, I realized that this is what's caused sort of my, you know, as I say, uh, when I was in high school, yeah, a little insecurity, didn't have a lot of confidence in my ability. I didn't even go out for the high school baseball team in my freshman year because I didn't think I was good enough. So, it's, uh, so once I connected the dots, I figured I wanted to scream it from the, from the rooftops that uh, this is what caused it and see if I can help some of the other kids who were my age uh, at the time I you know, really felt sort of insignificant. And created the Safe at Home Foundation. We created the Safe at Home Foundation, and it took us a little time because we had to talk about what we wanted to do. Uh, you know, did we want to be care providers? Well, you know, our talking, and, and I really give my older daughter, uh, Christina, and my wife, Allie, the credit for uh, really landing on the educational piece because if you're going to end the cycle of domestic violence, you really have to do it through education. And that is the goal, uh, demanding, ending the cycle. Yeah, ending, ending the cycle and, and saving lives. And, you know, I, I think uh, initially when we started our foundation and I was calling around for support from different people when we were talking about putting a fundraiser together, they said, oh, it's a woman's issue. And I didn't think enough people related to uh, how many young people uh, get caught up in that and get affected by it, even if they're, and, and me, I, I was never physically, uh, you know, abused. But there were scars of fear that, uh, I mean, they, they continue to be with me today, but now I, I understand mm. it. So you deal with it a little bit better. By the way, we're at uh, Liberty National Golf. This is an extraordinary a facility here in Jersey City. Um, you look outside here, the Statue of Liberty is just around the corner here. Um, it's an extraordinary place, and the folks at Cohen Resnick have allowed us to be here and interview Joe. And um, Joe, when we talk about the Safe at Home Foundation, Margaret's Place. Margaret, Margaret's Place, Margaret's yes. Place. Describe what that is. Margaret, your mom's name. Mm -hmm. These women, their children, they have a place to be safe. Talk about it. 
Well, uh, my mom was always there for me. Uh, I'm the youngest of five children. Uh, and, you know, when I got home from school, she was there. She was always there. I mean, I relied on her. Uh, I don't think she ever took a vacation, you know. Uh, you know, she had five children. I we used to kid about my brother Frank, uh, who, also was, ball who, who was the baseball yeah. player before I became a ball player. Says one of your sisters, I know, as a was is a, a nun, nun right? sister Marguerite. Right. And uh, so what we used to say that Frank was her favorite, and she and my mom used to say, "I have five fingers, and if you cut off any one of them, it's going to hurt the same." And uh, that that sort of resonated with me. And, so, you know, we named uh, safe rooms and schools for these, for these young people uh, after my mom, Margaret's place. It's a safe place for them to go. Uh, we have a master's level counselor. Uh, so if kids, like I did, I never wanted to talk about anything. And, and a big reason for that, Steve, is the fact that I thought I was the only one that was going through this. I, I knew there was nobody else in the neighborhood you know, when you close the door of their homes that anything was going on, because that's what I was thinking as a, as a youngster. And, um, you know, of course, you've come to find out differently when, when you get a little older and you, and you sort of understand uh, what's going uh, you know, the environment. So, you know, we, um, we put master's level counselor in each room, and they're there if the, if the uh, person, the youngster, wants to talk. Or if he or he or she wants to just read a book or play a game, uh, but more importantly, is there are other young people in the room, and they realize they're not alone, and it's not their fault. And those are the two messages that we we give at Margaret's place. You know, plus we give them tools to deal with what's going on in their life because you can't solve what's going on in their life. You just want to, you know, give them the self-esteem back that they really deserve at that age to, uh, to know they're going to come out on the other end of this thing. I'm curious about something. Given your extraordinary career and your position in baseball, not just as a great player and manager and someone who's garnered great respect, how often is, or does it happen that some of your colleagues in sports come and talk to you about this issue? Well, you know, I think... You talk to them, I think, more importantly. Now you can sort of a, all of a sudden uh, recognize some of the behavior. Uh, I've had players who have sort of, you know, retreated into themselves, uh, which is what I did. Because uh, I used to just, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, I'm embarrassed by it the way I am. So I, I can talk to players. And again, it's not like, I know what you're going through. It's just that a sense that you make them understand that you care a great deal about them. And, you know, like people in my line of work when I was managing, you know, players are not going to like, you know, some of the decisions I make and, and they're going to, you know, respond and react to it. And it got me to the point, Steve, of uh, what made them say it, you know. Well, why did they say that instead of what they said? Right. So I think it was a little better for me to understand my players and be able to sort of break through some of the facade or the, the, the shell they put around themselves to, to keep you from getting there, you know. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, it, it made a big difference in my life when all of a sudden I you know, wanted to talk about this thing because I, I just felt there was, there was a whole lot of it going on. One of the things um, in the limited time we have, and, and again, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And there's it's too important not to, Steve. We appreciate it. And there are countless people waiting to talk to Joe uh, at this uh, great Kona Resnick uh, outing that happens every year. This is the 25th anniversary of this charity outing that Kona Resnick has, raising money for the Safe at Home Foundation and the special operations uh, the Warriors Foundation, if you go to Yankee Stadium, those of us who are big Yankee fans, you see the sign for the uh, Special Ops, the Warriors Foundation, um, raises money for uh, the children um, of special operations, uh, these brave men and women who have been lost um, in war, in, in, in efforts fighting for our country. Those are the two charities that are being helped today. But Joe, my final question to you is about leadership. I did the same thing with you last year. But, um, 
I, I, as I talked about leadership because I'm fascinated by your, one of your books um, mm -hmm. that talks about leadership. Um, um, my book coming out is called The Lessons in Leadership. I asked you last year about this. So I'm going to do it again. The number one leadership, I asked you last year, lesson you learned, the number one leadership challenge that you have faced is? Well, the, the challenge is, is to, um, you know, first off, and I probably go a long way to get to the point you wanted to make. You know, every time I saw these books on the shelf, these shelves, these business books, so to speak, or leadership books, you felt like somebody was born with something extraordinary, that you couldn't get there, that they're going to tell you, I did this and I did that. My biggest challenge in, in writing Ground Rules for Winners was there, it, it's in everybody. Leadership? Just the understanding of leadership and what makes people follow. You know, what, what do I do? What I do is uh, you lead by example. You lead by example. You just don't say, hey, I'm the manager. You know, get online. Let's go. You, you understand that I know, especially in this, this world of technology, <laughs> that there is a human relationship that has to exist. You have to look in somebody's eyes. Uh, you have to be brave enough to deliver bad news. You know, you can't just say to one of my coaches, you know, go tell him he's not playing or, you know, go tell him to go upstairs and see the general manager, he's going to get released. Or send a text message. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just, uh, you know, I have a teenage daughter and, and I, I emphasize how important it is to, you know, to, to have this face-to-face -face contact because it doesn't take any kind of bravery to send a text message because you don't have to see the response. Or, or see how much you're hurting somebody. So, you know, to me, it's, it's lead by example and make it uh, understandable. You know, I've, I've got 25 players on my team, and not everybody can hit through 30 home runs. Not everybody can win 20 ball games as a pitcher, but everybody can do the best they can. And it's my job to put that person in a position where they'll succeed. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's what I have to recognize. And the only way you do that is to know your people. Yeah. And, and I, you know, leadership, uh, again, you're, you're just trying to, you know, put people in a position where they can succeed. And, and I, I tell my players, at some point during the course of this year, and we play 162 in baseball, you're going to be put in a position where you're going to help this club win a ball game. Yeah. And it may be something that isn't written about or talked about, but your teammates will know. And, and to me, you know, it, it, you know, it's nice to get recognition, but you, you're really playing for the respect of that guy in the, in the locker next to you. And baseball may be a metaphor for every profession. I think is. so. Yeah. Joe, you honor us, and um, we thank you um, in public broadcasting and everyone else watching us on digital as you said, platforms. Um, and um, we want to thank the folks at Cohen Resnick for allowing us to, to be with you. Um, we appreciate everything you, you do, and um, particularly with the Safe at Home Foundation with Allie, your wife. Well, it's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here because of the work you do, and uh, thank you for letting people know the work we do. Thank you, Joe. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Mary Ellen Klein, PhD, is uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Claremont Medical Center, part of uh, Barnabas Health. Um, I've got to ask you, what does it mean to you to be selected as one of the 50 best women in the state by NJ Biz. I am truly honored, Steve, to have been recognized for this award. I have worked very hard through Barnabas Health, and I'm just delighted that I have the support of Barry Ostrowski, our president and CEO, to be able to move me forward into this arena and allow me to do what I do best at the hospital.
You know, it's interesting. Everyone who has been selected by the magazine, by NJBiz, has had a different path to leadership. And Mary Ellen's is fascinating because she comes at it with a nursing background. You get your doctorate. Did you ever say to yourself, I'm going to be the head of, of a hospital? Was that your plan? It was never my plan. My ultimate goal coming out of nursing school was to be a nurse manager. And I thoroughly enjoyed administration. And through great mentors that have been with me throughout my career, I've been truly able to flourish. And because they've believed in me, that's why I am where I am today. So what does that tell you about ceilings or limits women or any of us put on ourselves? There are absolutely no limits at all, Steve. We're all here to serve a purpose and to do the best we can do to be ourselves and to be here for the people we serve and you will get to where you need to be because of it. Best advice you can give to uh, women watching right now who aspire to leadership? To keep moving forward, it will happen. Never give up and stay brave in your leadership. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Valley National Bank, NJIT, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, the Russell Berry Foundation, ShopRite Supermarkets, ADP, and by Suez. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. I think at NJIT there are a lot of smart students. I came to NJIT for mechanical engineering because within state it's one of uh, probably the top three schools for engineering. It sort of creates a friendly competition where you know you can learn from them. It's a great academic school. I feel I'm being challenged, but at the same time I love the classes I'm taking. The atmosphere of being here is like a being at an upstart company. It's that same kind of drive, that same kind of passion. 